The Volta River Authority is 57 years old and we're privileged to have with us here the Chief Executive of the Authority who's going to be talking to us about what VRA is going to do or is hoping to do in the next few years, what the history of VRA has been and how they've been able to achieve some of the successes they have achieved, especially looking at the role they play in the power generation sector here in Ghana and uh, thank you for making time to join us for this conversation. Thank you Israel. Right. First of all let me congratulate you on the occasion of your 57th anniversary. Thank you very much Israel. But isn't it strange that we are celebrating 57 years? I mean under normal circumstances you will celebrate 50 years or 60 years. We are 57. So why 57? You know two things. We've actually, the public has invested in us. We've looked after the assets very well. I mean, our generating assets. So, and we've also delivered on our mandate. The mandate being generating electricity to support economic growth. We've done that. But the environment is changing. And we've got to change as well. Okay. So one of the reasons why we are celebrating 15, uh, 57 years is that the time has come for, for us to change our business model. That's precisely why we are celebrating 15 okay. years. Yeah. All right. We'll be delving a bit more into that. So what has accounted for VRA's success in the last 57 years, considering that most of the state institutions that we are aware of have uh, had to collapse somewhere along the line? I think VRA was set up in a very structured way. If you look at the act that sets us up, we are well structured. And we've been able to operate along prudent industry uh, standards. That's how the culture was built for the organization. And we've kept that culture for 57 years. Tell us a bit about some of the culture, this culture you're talking about. Attention to maintenance, investing in our human capital. Those are the two good things that we, we've done. We've operated based on standards that are acceptable elsewhere, not in, in our part of the world, not in our sub-region, but outside, let's say in, the, in what we call the first world countries. And we've been able to succeed that over, over all these years. So essentially, globally accepted standards. Exactly. Not, That's the, what not the way we tend to do our things. No, not as they, they like to say in the southern part of <laughs> Africa, yes. <laughs> right, the theme of the anniversary is the new VRA, powering the future. Can you tell us why the choice of this other style? Yes, we thought carefully about where we've got to in our, in our, um, in our um, life as an institution. And we've come to the realization that we've got to turn the corner and do things slightly differently because one, the environment that we are working in has changed. Our business environment has changed. Government policies have changed. There's been IPPs. So we've got to move with the, with, with the wind, so to speak. So we, we asked ourselves, what can we do differently now? And what we set ourselves out to do, which is what we, we, we put in quotes, the new VR, is to be able to restructure refocus the organization into a financially sustainable, growing, uh, multi-business holding company. That's what we want to do. So we've chosen those words carefully. The new VRA. The new VRA. Is, is that to suggest that probably you, uh, you're talking about financially viable and sustainable business? Does it mean that you've had you know, challenges? Exactly. That's why I say we did an introspection. We know we've had challenges over the last couple of years. It's important that we get our finances right. It's not only us, it's, it's the government and us as well. And uh, we've come to the, the realization that that's a key thing that we have to do. So there are two things about the theme. The new VR, which I just, I just explained to you, and also the fact that we continue to power the future. Powering the future is that we are going to continue to deliver our mandate as a state institution, but as I said, with a private sector mindset. All right. So that, those are the two halves of the team for this year. Okay, now 50, 57 years, it's clearly a long time in, in the organization's development. What are the key initiatives or changes that I, we expected uh, or we should expect that is going to come from the VRA, uh, for instance, at VRA at 60? That's in three years' time. Okay, VRA at 60, it's, it's pretty close. I mean, it's three years, but yeah. it's just like tomorrow, it can happen it's tomorrow. True. And so we've built the new VRA al al along four pillars. The first one is to um, improve our human capital. That's the most, uh, our business is about our people. 
we've got to invest and improve our human capital. Number two, we've got to be financially sustainable, which is something that I discussed already. Yeah. Number three, we've got to expand our environmental footprint. We are in an era of renewables. That's where the disruption is coming into the power sector. We've got to do that. And last but not the least, we've got to leverage IT to improve our internal business processes so that we become more competitive. Right. So those are the four things we'll be looking at as we move from 57 years to 60 years. Now, VRA has, you talk about improving the human resource capacity, yes. but VRA has some of the finest engineers and so I'm wondering what else you want to improve? Yeah, that's, that's true. And it's flattering for you to say that, uh, uh, Israel. But no, that's but not it's true. Yes, I mean, it's a fact. VRA <laughs> engineers have moved on to, you know, their well-standard engineers. And I've met a number of them. I agree with you, Israel. But our environment, as I said, is changing. There's competition. We've got to deliver, uh, develop the skills that allows us to compete with the IPPs. The way the, uh, the, the power sector is run in the global space today is different. So we've got to uh, develop the skills that will allow us to be able to compete in this new space. Negotiation, for example, is a key thing. Right. Planning is a, is right. a key thing and all that. So we've got to, we have the good guys, but that's not the end of it. Okay. We've got to have guys that who are fit for the 21st century. Let me put it that so way. So probably if you take a, an engineer, you, you're probably looking at having an engineer that can also negotiate. Exactly. An engineer, and better still, an engineer who has a commercial orientation. Right. You know, the challenge about, about how we operated in the past, especially because we, were, we still continue to be a, a public utility, is that we were out for the public good. That was our foremost concern. That was our mandate. But now we have to begin to operate with some commercial sense. So we've got to have engineers very skilled, very good, but they think along commercial lines. They control costs. Because you're being asked to drive down your costs. Exactly. That's exactly what that, we want to do. That's a new paradigm we find ourselves exactly. in. Exactly. So yeah. we, we, the consumers, want cheaper electricity. Exactly. And we've got to be able to compete. Because we have IPPs, costs are going to go down. We've got to, be, uh, we've got to position ourselves to be able to compete properly. What are some of the challenges you encounter being in an environment where there are so many IPPs that you have to contend with? The IPPs operate slightly differently. And they come into a certain space within the power value chain. First of all, they are profit-oriented. They are profit-oriented. They don't have the public good or public sector mandate that we have. So it's a little difficult to compare us and the IPPs. But be as it may, we still have to compete with them. As you just right, rightly said, the consumer wants electricity at the least cost. So we've got to compete with them anyway. But we've got to look for that niche where we take advantage of our being a public sector institution and compete with them on, 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 on the private sector arrangement as well. For instance, uh, you're the only one who owns the uh, hydro dam. Yes, and it the, is. The IPPs are having to contend with thermal. Yes, but we're also in the thermal space, and we are competing with them in the thermal space. The hydro will always be there. The hydro is considered to be a legacy that has been bestowed on us. But moving forward, we are going to do a lot more thermal, and we've got to compete with, with the IPPs. Do you think that VRA is responding that well to the competition from the IPPs? Yes, I think that we are. I think that we can hold our own when it comes to thermal generation. Except that when the IPPs come in, they come in through government guarantees. So that okay. tends to distort the market and it distorts the pricing in the market. That's where the challenge is. Because we don't have the backing of government when it comes to those guarantees. Why? Can't you have access to those guarantees as well? Well, we are a state institution. And so, um, the, let me put it this way. There, is, there isn't that desire on the part of the government to entice us to come into, the, into space. the space. That's our mandate anyway, so go ahead and do it. The IPPs, you've got to entice them. And there has to be something that I have to dangle in front of them before they come in. So you throw, they throw all sorts of um, you know, pegs at them. Unfortunately, that's what happens. Pegs that um, you wish you would have had. 
If we had the same treatment, I'm not complaining, <laughs> but if we had the same treatment, I'll be glad. <laughs> How do you have this conversation with you, Israel? All right, now, uh, you earlier hinted the fact that VRA is, uh, is being restructured into a holding company. Yes. I would want you to throw more light on that. The steer or the directive that we have from government, you know, it's a new government uh, policy in the power sector, is that we should reconstitute ourselves from what we are right now into a holding company with three main subsidiaries. We'll have a hydro subsidiary that would operate our current hydro assets, which is uh, Akosombo and Pong, and expand the thermal assets, meaning that we can do more, uh, sorry, and expand the hydro assets, meaning that we can do more hydro projects. We'll have a second subsidiary which will, which will house all our thermal assets and we'll expand those assets with the private sector. Then we'll have what we call our investment. That'll be the third subsidiary where we'll put together all our investments in the hotel, the school, the hospital, our real estate, etc., farm farms, etc. So those are investments. But the key thing about the, 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 the policy is that this investment should operate along commercial lines. All right. Yes. All right. So you've talked about the hydro um, unit, you've talked about the thermal, Yes. and you've talked about the investment. Where would you put the solar? Solar will be part of the hydro. The hydro, it's a, it's a broad name for renewables. Let's put it that way. So we are not going to really isolate a unit and call it this is a renewable subsidiary. It may well be that we'll do that in the future. But we, we see that as part of our portfolio of assets along the, the hydro sp in the hydro space. I know that uh, VRA has some invested a bit in solar because we, we're getting some megawatts of electricity yes. from mm -hmm. solar. What's the future as far as that is concerned? Uh, okay, that's a good question, uh, Israel. But let me put it in context. And, uh, we in VRA have always blazed the trail when it comes to the development of power generating plants in the country. We started with hydro in Akosumbo. We moved on to Terma. The IPPs have caught up with us in Terma. We want to be at the forefront of the development of renewables, solar included. So the first thing we did was to set up a, a solar power plant, two and a half megawatts. It's small, but the whole idea uh, with that two and a half megawatt plant in Navrongo was to give us the operating experience in large scale, utility scale solar, that's the way we put it. We have that. It's been in place for a while now. So we've decided to expand that portfolio. So th this year, we've started the development of two projects. Uh, in all, they add up to 12 megawatts. Oh, wow. Four megawatts in Laura, eight megawatts in Kaliu. There's a potential to expand even those, those two projects by an additional five megawatts. So we are looking at 17 megawatts. That's, we are going through a procurement process right now with funding from the, from the German government. So that's in place, and hopefully by the end of this year, we'll commission one of them. All right, so that, in addition to the Navrongo one, makes will take it to 19? Yes, eventually. 19, eventually, yes. Mm -hmm. But we have other projects in the pipeline. There's one that we want to site at Bongo. That's about 30 megawatts. That's also in the development that's phase. Massive. That's massive, yes. But we are moving on to bigger things beyond that. All right. We just uh, looked at a site in Wale Wale. We think that we can develop between 40 to 70 megawatts there. So that's also another potential that we are right. seriously looking so at. So all this is not necessarily just solar, because it could be wind as well. Well, wind is a di we have a different program for all wind. Right. Yeah, what I just described is solar. It's all solar. Solar, yes. Wind, we have two wind projects, one in the Ada area and one in the in the Volta region around Angloga. These are 75 megawatt plants, which are huge. 75? each. So both add up to 150 megawatts. We are doing that through private sector, with the private sector. Now, permit me, are there any advantages that wind has over solar? Because I know solar, you need the sun. But if the yes. sun is out, then you really don't have much, except for your batteries. Okay, from the from the perspective of dispatchability, meaning the ability to, to run the plant all the time, they are the same because they are, it's solar is, is a natural resource. Wind is also a natural resource. So at any time, they can, they, 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 they can be disrupted. 
So from that perspective, fine. But in terms of the economics and how it's, it's there are two different uh, sources of power altogether. Right. They are both renewable, but they are operated differently. Of all the various sources we draw our power from, hydro happens to be one of the cheapest. Why people ask all the time, why are we not developing other hydro plants? Yes, uh, there are other, other potential hydro sites that can be developed. But the question to ask yourself is if, whether they can be technically developed and whether it makes commercial sense to operate them. So uh, we've start, we started uh, hydro development with Akosumbo, large scale cheapest. It's worked for us. From then on, we went to Pong because that's the one that made sense to go to from, from a technical and economic perspective. After that, we developed Bui. That's the end of all our large-scale hydro plants. The rest are of the size of 100 megawatts and below. So if you look at the Volta Basin, for example, there are two potential sites that could be developed. They come with their challenges, but uh, they can be developed. One is Pualugu. It's under study now. What we are doing with Pualugu is we are dimensioning it as a multi-purpose project. With, and the, the idea behind it is we want to have an irrigation component, All right. we want to have a power generation component, and we want to have a, what we call flood control component. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard about the discharge of uh, water from, from Burkina Faso, Faso, and then what, what happens to people who live along the, line, uh, the, the shores of the White Volta River. So that is, that is what we are working on right now. The study is ongoing. We are hopeful that in the next couple of months, the studies will be com completed and we'll be able to make a decision on when to develop it. Mm -hmm. The other side that can be developed is called Juali. Juali is close to a place called Otidamanko, just north of Kitekrachi. That's the confluence between the lake proper and the Oti River. That could also be developed. It comes with its challenges anyway. If you want to develop the full potential of that particular site, which is roughly about 90 megawatts, parts of Togo will be, will be flooded. Oh, wow. You know, it, yes, and you know, these transboundary things take a long time to develop. So it's something that the Togolese and Beninois have expressed an interest well, in. So they're keen about it. They are keen about it. If you, if you, anytime there's a discussion, it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> but we know it takes time to develop these uh, cross-border projects. But it's something that we've done feasibility studies on. We will continue to do additional studies until we get to the point where it makes the right timing is, is there for us to develop that project. Now, it gets to one other question that people keep asking all the time is, why can't we pump the water downstream from the Kosumbo Dam back into the lake so that we can get more power? Mm -hmm. How feasible is it? Is it? This issue comes up any time there's a power shortage. And we've dealt with it for years and years and years. There's a technical reason and there's a financial reason why we can't do it. But let me just tell you. Let me just summarize it for you. The whole cycle of pumping water from downstream into the lake and then using it to generate electricity, that whole cycle has what we call an efficiency of about 66%, meaning that you need, when for every one unit of electricity that you use to pump, you will get uh, 0.66 of it. Or for every 10 units of electricity that you use to pump, you will get six units coming out of it. So, so you're actually earning less. Exactly, you are earning less. So in places where these things are done, you have to have a very cheap source of power. Maybe nuclear, maybe some other form of power that's very cheap. That's the only way you can close that gap. Do you see? Maybe solar. Solar is too expensive for that. And the amounts of water that you will have to pump for it to make sense. In a lake like Akosumbu, that's a lot of water. You need a lot of power to do that. Just for it to even make a dent in the elevation of the lake, you need a lot of water for Essentially, that. Essentially, you're saying it's not practical. It's not practical. No. Maybe one day when technology improves and the whole efficiency of that cycle moves up, maybe when you get to that technology envelope, it will make sense. I know I've given you a technical answer, but I'm hopeful that it's as simple as I would, I would like it to be. Important thing, as I said, is that what you put in, you get far less than. All right, we've talked about um, solar, wind, thermal, and all. How about nuclear? That's interesting. <laughs> Anytime you bring up the issue of nuclear, you always see a smile on somebody's <laughs> face. 
Yes, that's nuclear is, a, is an option. It's an option that we've always looked at. I quite remember in, in, in the year 2008, there was a presidential commission that looked at nuclear. They made some recommendations. They had a 10-year roadmap, and some work was done. It's being built on right now. The Nuclear Power Institute is doing, is building on the work that was done in the past. We are fully supporting the, the NPI, the Nuclear Power Institute, to be able to carry out the, the arrangement towards power generation from nuclear. Um, you're giving the support that we, we, we can. We actually have a couple of engineers in Korea undertaking nuclear engineering. The objective being that if a nuclear plant, when the nuclear plant is eventual, eventually developed, you, you will have the personnel. You have the personnel to do it. You know the thing about these projects, these uh, projects is that you've got to develop the capacity first, the <coughs> capacity to run the the nuclear plant first, and so that's one of the things that we are doing. Mm. Okay. Let's come back to the investments because you're going to have uh, an investment unit as part of the holding company of, yes. of VRA. We know you're into. Um, hospitality, you know, lake transports and the rest. How can we be assured that we're going to continue to the good quality that we've enjoyed from uh, VRA as well? Israel, you can take that for granted. I mean, the new VRA is going to even do things much better than we've done. As I said, we've done our own introspection. We have a good plan for, for our subsidiaries. We are going to transition them all into commercial operations and they can even deliver better service. So in the case of the hotel, for example, we are currently managing it. It's not under any international brand. What we want to do is to join venture with the private sector, get a major brand, whether it's the Moving Pigs or the Sheraton, Sheratons, okay. etc. And then they would improve the services that the, the hotel provides. And then uh, we'll be better off for it. So we continue to add value. Yeah, they bring their quality to bear exactly. on, on the services yes. that you provide. And we get locked into the international tourism network. Right. Yes. Now, one in the last uh, couple of years, Ghana has had to deal a lot with the uh, pollution of our water bodies as a result of Galamse and the rest. But we look at the Volta River, and the Volta River appears to have been untouched relatively un un untouched. How have you been able to manage that? You know, the Volta Lake, as a result of the construction of the Laguna, is an asset that has been entrusted to us, and we've guarded it with our lives. That's always been our, our attitude towards the assets that have been given to us. So we've taken the necessary measures to ensure that there is, one, there is no pollution, that uh, from the fringes or from the edges of the lake or the banks of the lake, so we've guarded, we've guarded the lake, the lake shore, etc., as, as well as, as I said, based on international standards. And so we haven't had that migration of pollution from the edges of the lake. We've been into, we've done afforestation to make sure that the integrity of the lake and the shoreline is maintained. We have the same uh, environmental, um, uh, call it the environmental situation for the lack of a better word around the lake. So we've done that, but it's not come easy. There are a lot of things that we have done in terms of enforcing and making sure that the right things are done. There are a lot of operators around the lake, especially downstream of Pong. People want to set up fish farms, people want to set up quarries, etc., etc. But we've always gone through a process of asking for a permit from, from us. And we work with the EPA in this and the Water Resources Commission to get uh, those objectives achieved. But the import most important thing is that we've invested in managing the lake We've invested in enf enforcing the, 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 the guidelines that guide the operation of the lake. What are some of the practices that you have engaged in that you think that can help us as a country better police the other water bodies that we have? I think that you've got to have a lot of community engagement. You know, we do a lot of community engagement as part of our work. Remember that we have what we call the Unipanua, which is a medical boat that goes around. Once you're able to engage the communities that live along the shores of the lake, you can get their buy-in in maintaining the, 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 the water body in as pristine a state as we just described it. But if you have people who are chasing for gold, yes. they will defy whatever you try to throw at them. And uh, whatever community engagement you, you talk about or you involve yourself in, they will still want to go ahead to mine. 
how, how do you deal with a case like that? In, the case, in our case, we haven't come into a situation where, or we haven't been confronted with a situation of people trying to mine uh, gold. I know there's been a case, we have one instance where somebody wanted to mine limestone, which is close by. We didn't grant the permit. And we've been keeping an eye on, on, on that uh, facility. I, th I think that, as I said earlier, once you engage the community and you have alternative livelihood arrangements for them, it tends to keep them away. And I say this because afforestation is another way of polluting, uh, well, lack of forest cover is another way of polluting the lake. Right. You know, people cut wood just for, uh, for, for, for cooking, etc. Mm. Once you have an afforestation program and once you have a livelihood program to go with that, people don't tend to, to cause that environmental pollution that will come from cutting down the trees along the lake. So it's true that we don't have gold and other things there, but the environmental issues that confront us are slightly different, and we have a different approach to handling it. That's why we are successful. Right. What is the role of uh, VRA in the South region, in particular the West African power pool? Good question. West African power pool is a great vehicle for us. We've always been part of it right from the beginning. What the West African Power Pool simply does is that it's just a collection of all the power utilities in the ECOWAS region. We agreed to come together to trade power. But what it does for us is that it opens us to a population of close to 300 million. The electrification rate in, in, in the ECOWAS region is 20 to 30 percent. So in Israel, you can imagine, you have 200 million people without access to electricity. That gives us a great opportunity to penetrate that market and deliver electricity to people who don't have it. It's a great market for us and we continue to, to look at that. You know, we've been in this business of uh, trading with other countries for a long time. Our first export of power was to Togo Benin. It was in 1972, so it's almost 50 years. Cote d'Ivoire, we've been exchanging power with them since 1983. So we know that. So that's why we are taking a leadership role in the whole West African power pool arrangement. You may have heard in the news recently that we are, from the beginning of next month, in May, we'll begin to export power to Burkina Faso in large quantities, up to 100 megawatts. That's mm -hmm. huge. That's yeah. a lot of power that we are exporting. It's all within the West African power pool arrangement. We are solidly for the West African power pool arrangement because it grants us that market in the sub-region. And Israel, you know, VIA's brand it's much greater in the in the in the West African uh, sub-region than even here in okay. Ghana. Mm. How is that possible? Because we've done our job well <laughs> in the sub-region. I think that probably because we've had a couple of difficulties with uh, power supply. Okay. You know, as they say, no prophet is acceptable <laughs> in his own. <laughs> but that's not to say the public do not appreciate that. We appreciate the, the public's acceptance of our services. Right. On this special day of your uh, 57th anniversary, what message do you have for the staff of the authority as well as the nation as a whole? For the, my colleagues, I'll just say, let's, let's keep on doing the good job that we are doing. We've set ourselves a very high bar. We said we, we've told ourselves we want to be the gold standard for utilities in Africa. Let's continue to man, uh, uh, keep that mandate. We'll still provide the public service because we are a state institution, but we'll do it with a commercial orientation private sector. That's the way we will go. As far as the public is concerned, we'll continue to provide electricity to support the, the economic and social development of the country. I'm hopeful, very hopeful, that we may probably have put Dumsor to bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to end it. But thank you very much uh, for making time uh, to speak with us and to have this conversation with us. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Israel, for having me. Thank you.